Welcome everyone to a new episode of this style of format of What the Lord Has Done For Me podcast. My name is Shelton Rivera. I'm with Brotherly Love Ministry. And before I invite my guests to um, come on this episode, I just want to admonish you to hit the like button and um, subscribe to the channel and also share this video. It's important that if you were truly blessed by these testimonies to share these videos and share that blessing with others. And I know that I've been truly blessed by everybody that has come on, so I like to uh, invite my guest on here. It's, I'm honored to have him. He is my literal brother, uh, Brother Jose Rivera. So I like to uh, welcome you. Uh, thank you for coming and sharing your testimony with the audience. <laughs> Glad to be here, man. Thank you for inviting me. It's always a privilege to share your testimony. Yes, yeah, so uh, I guess without uh, further ado, let's just jump right into it and uh, just tell me about your upbringing and how was life like growing up with parents, growing up with siblings? You know, were you close? Did you have family devotions? Kind of all those dynamics of growing up. Okay, yeah, so we had a beautiful family, you know, we had very loving parents, mom and dad, they were great parents, you know, I couldn't ask for better parents, you know, they were just very loving to us, um, my brother, you know, we were always very close, and yeah. then we have an older sister, I'm the middle, he's the younger, and then my sister's the oldest, and so I think we all got along as a family, you know, we had a close family unity, um, we enjoyed spending time. My father worked hard to provide for our family, and so when he was off on the weekends, we always had family time every weekend. You know, we would go out on Sunday, sometimes to the park, sometimes we'd go on outings to the beach, or any time that we could spend family time together, that's what we did, and I just yeah. praise the Lord for our family. Very, very close, good family. Okay, uh, so speak a little bit about... Um maybe uh, growing up with family devotions. I know that we had started uh, as a family to get together with that. Um, you know, how was that? And how was that also an impact of your life even maybe today? Yeah, for sure. Um, when we were very young, I remember distinctly that mom and dad would have daily devotions. We had this little book that I don't even remember exactly what it was called, but it was a devotion book. It had like a Noah's Ark and rainbow on it, and it was basically scripture readings for 365 days. And we would read that book and discuss, and Dad would always have us to say a memory verse. Yeah. <laughs> and we would say our memory verse, and then my father, he always quoted this memory verse, Proverbs 3.6. 3, 6. 6. You know, in all thy ways acknowledge him. And he shall direct thy path. Yeah. Today, that that verse has been kind of inherited by us. That's that's my favorite verse. You know that Dad kind of passed on. Yeah. And very impactful in our family. And you know, to answer the latter portion of your question, for sure, those early seeds, God was able to utilize them, and they brought forth fruit later on in my life. There was a period in between where I. I shamefully say that I didn't put the Lord first in my life. But I'm thankful for His mercy. And I look back and I just thank God for loving parents that were willing to plant seeds according to the light that they had in us. Yeah. So maybe, I guess, uh, explain a little bit about, you know, the closeness of the family. Um, I guess maybe... Uh, a story or two that kind of uh, relates to what closeness or what bondness or love kind of meant to you as, as a child, you know, that you appreciated the family coming together for different things. So. Yeah, um, with our family, I would say my brother and I, we were super close. Um, 
we were close to our sister too, but I think more so since we were boys, we tended to play together more. She was a little older than us. We're all roughly three years apart. Uh, so she was a little older, and so we would play boy things, and she would do her girl things. So we just had a, a closeness because of you know the the fact that we were boys and we were younger. And um, I also feel that one thing I want to say about about mom and dad that I discern, they really had a principle of sacrifice in order to make sure that we were taken care of and that we were good. You know, when you're a young man, you don't realize how much your parents invest into you. And it's not until I'm older that I realize that they went through a lot in order to give us the best. They didn't have to put us in a Christian academy, but they did. And now that I'm older and see the cost of that, I mean, <laughs> that that's pricey for a lot of just blue-collar, middle-income families. Uh, we weren't necessarily poor, but we were far from rich, you know. And so Dad had to work sometimes two or three jobs in order to maintain a Christian education. And so I remember that about my parents, that they would often... Um, sacrifice and spend what they needed to do in order to provide for us. Uh, a lot of times I w we would ask our parents for things, whether it was, you know, toys or interests that we have, maybe some shoes. And I could kind of see in my mom's face that there was a struggle. Sometimes she would tell us plainly, like, no, nah, that's too expensive. You can't have that. Yeah. <laughs> but a lot of times... Um, I could see that I couldn't put my finger on it when I was young, even though I discerned there was like a maybe a response or a reaction. But what I saw was she wanted to give us the things that we wanted, but I knew that they couldn't always afford it. And so many times they would sacrifice to to bless us. Now, I want to transition, if you don't mind me sharing, I do want to share one story to kind of highlight a little bit about what you said, about maybe a story or an event or something. Yeah. Um, one, one aspect of our family, there are many things that, you know, maybe like other families, uh, there are certain things about your family, but this is probably common amongst many families. Um, we had a super, super... Um, I'm going to say affinity of if, if there's one holiday that we celebrated above any other holiday, it was Christmas. I yeah. mean, now that we're a lot older and stuff, probably not so much, you know, as when we were young. But when we were young, I mean, Christmas was the holiday. And I remember our parents always made sure that there was presents under that tree, even if we had to shop at the dollar store and buy little, yeah. little things. Because you can get more than one item. Yeah, <laughs> you can get several items for very uh, inexpensive. And I remember the little dynamics that we had, like we would go to the store and shop with, you know, like let's say uh, I would be with my dad while my brother and my sister would be with my mom. And then we'd switch it up and stuff to buy one another gifts and presents. Um, and so that, that was a joy, you know, doing the little shopping and Christmas hunting to get presents one for another. That kind of built up a bond of unity. And then one little Christmas story that I want to share specifically is when I was very young. I, I don't even remember the exact age. I want to say I was about five or six years old. And I don't even know if you would have remembered because that means you were like three years old. Yeah, you know? probably not. But I remember my dad loading us all up in the car. There were a lot of presents and food. And he had bought a Christmas tree and, and tied it to the top of the car. And we made our way, and I noticed we weren't going home. And I was just like, Dad, where we're we going? You know, because I didn't recognize it. Not that I really knew my directions at five years old. But I, I remember asking Dad, like, hey, where are we going? And he says, we're going to go drop this off at such and such family. And so when we arrived at this family's house, they knocked on the door. My dad is holding this big Christmas tree in his hand. I'm helping my mom carry whatever stuff we can with the groceries and the gifts. And when that door opened, I mean, the look on that family's face of surprise, of joy, of appreciation, of gratefulness, I mean, gladness. I mean, 
it was the first impactful, you know, the impression that was left on my little mind for how happy. I remember the children jumping up and down for joy, the mother of that family erupting in tears, the father nearly crying and just kept hugging my dad and telling him, thank you so much what you've done for my family. Later on, I found out that that was a new family who had been coming to the church. They were a little on the poor side, and my father and mother had decided to sacrifice and bring Christmas to that family as a way of, you know, reaching out to them and welcoming them to our church. And there was something about that I've never forgotten that at an early age, I just remember feeling what a blessing this, this was, even though at that time I wouldn't have been able to express it that way. Five years old, I, I didn't know, but it was just such an impact on my little young mind. And now that I'm older and I'm in the ministry and I understand about the gospel now, I realize what that was. That was how you show love to your fellow man. You know, helping those who needed help, loving those who need love. Those people were seeking for support system, for love, for direction. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't something that was without, you know, great benefit. My, my father just decided to donate to this family. And those things still echo in my heart today. That uh, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And, and I, would, I would probably say that as my answer. I, I thank the Lord for that young experience and I I owe my parents a great deal of gratitude and the Lord for that you know that impression yeah and they also had I mean so many countless things that we can uh, think of and be grateful for of the you know upbringing of our parents of all these uh, little seeds that uh, carried with us throughout I mean we mentioned uh, you mentioned about the um, devotions you mentioned about you know these cases of helping individuals and just the closeness of the family drawing together you know having uh, love for individuals and I'm sure that that uh, carried on into your maybe like high school days or even you know just growing older away from parents you still had that uh, love because of what your parents had showed you and you were able to I guess you know, share that with others. You didn't treat others, you know, any any differently uh, besides what you had learned of love. Speak maybe a little bit on that. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate you kind of bringing that up. I, I would say that I think even though even though I can't express how it all comes together, there's an influence in the home that when there's love in the home and there's respect one for another, you know, no, no, don't get me wrong. We have our shared family problems. Yeah. But we weren't one of those families that were yelling at each other and cussing at each other and throwing things at each other. Uh, sure, you know, there's always issues that rise up in every family. But for the most part, uh, I look back on my childhood and I, and most of my memories are, like you said, love, unity, treating one another, smiles, and good times. Uh, every once in a while, you know, the devil shows his ugly face and he has to be dealt with, you know. But yeah. for the most part, majority of my, my memories. And I think that that influence and the teachings of our parents, especially my mother, you know, be respectful to your elders, treat other people kindly, you need to share. Those are positive principles to instill in children and it will help them to have a better respect for society around them. And I think that um, to this day, I still cherish childhood friendships and interact with you know people in my youth because loyalty, true friendship, and putting others first, and I praise God for it, those are some of the things that He had placed in our life. And it helped to cultivate a healthy social um, interaction with my classmates and friends that I've developed through the years. Yeah. Uh, I guess we can start uh, uh, transitioning into uh, maybe 
uh, things that you started to struggle with? Like what was the, the beginning of, I guess, the walking away from God and kind of leaving those principles um, maybe to the side? I mean, of course, uh, like anybody else that may have uh, been raised that same way, I mean, you still have that guilty conscience that maybe should I be doing it yeah. or... But I guess that transition period of kind of the walking away from God. Okay, yeah. So I kind of want to paint a picture. Um, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 3, the last message to the seven churches is to Laodicea. And in Laodicea, the problem with Laodicea is that there's this lukewarm condition. And I don't fully blame my parents for that, although everyone is going to be held responsible and accountable for the life that they have. But it was sort of the Adventism that I was born into. You know, our family wasn't so distinctly different in its spiritual practice than the other families around. And so while we did abstain from a lot of um, complete secular and worldly things, we still had plenty of room for improvement within our own family. Yeah. And as I look back on it, this is looking back now, I look back and say some of the things that we could have done better as a family would be the seeds that come through the television and they find lodgment in the mind. And so I was exposed to some of those things. I watched TV. I watched cartoons. And the long, you know, the years, they used to rate the movies and stuff. It used to be yeah. like rated G, rated PG or whatever. But now they don't rate it. I don't know if they rate anything anymore. It's been so long since I watched TV. But I don't think they rate anything. But, you know, the older you get, you're more exposed to these profanities violent scenes, action movies, shooting people, killing people. Those are all scenes, and it's called the entertainment world. Yeah. And so those seeds fall into us. We played video games. And I, and I understand a little bit about the struggle of my parents. We live in a society where many times in middle class families, both parents have to work. And so we didn't live in the most safest neighborhood, and so... Many hours we had to spend indoors. Mama didn't want us going outside while she and dad were working. And so we, she was able to arrange to get us a ride. We'd go home from school. But there was few hours where we were by ourselves. And that created somewhat like idle time. And during that time, it'd be TV, it'd be video games. And those were the seeds that the devil we're, we're in a we're in a great controversy yeah you know there's a pool between good and evil it's not that my parents didn't give us good seeds of of training but in the great controversy we are exposed to a lot of the music and a lot of the movies and the video games and so i was early drawn the the culture and atmosphere that i was around you know surrounded rap music and hip hop and things like that a lot of my friends at school, they were into those things and they would listen to it and they'd give me some of the CDs and the albums and I'd listen to these rap songs and you start you start emulating the, the fashion, the dress styles, the baggy clothes. I remember growing my hair really long <laughs> and getting braids and stuff, you know, trying to emulate those individuals that we watched on TV and whatnot. And so that created a pull towards the world in my early years um, as I started getting older to eighth grade and then high school. Okay, uh, so maybe I guess uh, transitioning to maybe um, middle school or high school I mean, what, what more did you start getting involved with, uh, like uh, the world and stuff, and uh, I guess more the downfall because, you know, now you're away from uh, parents, you're away from those good influences, and now you, 
you know, unfortunately, we I, I'm sure everybody has come across it where you just get into more um, negative or just um, not in good direction influences by friends of other people. And, mm -hmm. and mind you, I mean, we uh, we both went to Adventist College, so all of this, or Adventist uh, High School, so all of this is going on in um, Adventist schools. Right. Uh, so maybe I guess talk a little bit about that, or yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, a Adventist education. I appreciate the sacrifice that our parents gave us in that direction, but you know, it's not fully free from the influences of the world. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, it's a greater target on these schools because the devil is wroth with the woman and goes to make war with the remnant. That's right. And so for those of you who know Bible truth, um, you know, that represents that the devil has a special target on the last day people of this God, which I believe is the seven day Adventist church. And so you know, those great controversy elements exist in that school. And so when I was in high school, um, the way that the devil works that I have discerned through reading and through experience, personal experience, is he leads you on little by little. You don't exactly realize. I'll give you an example, okay? You forgive me, I, I tend to do be a little preacher here. <laughs> but we grew up in Florida, and of course, Florida is known for its beaches. We used to go to the beach frequently. And there's something about the currents, the riptides in the beach. You'd be out there playing in the water, okay? You're just having fun in the waves, and you had a little picnic blanket and stuff set up. You're playing in the water, and next thing you know, you're ready to, you know, maybe go get some drink. Maybe you get hungry, you want to go back to the little picnic. And you're all the way down, you know, a long way distance away from where your where your picnic was. Yeah. And here's the thing, you're out there playing in the waves and you've been drifting, not realizing it. Because you're having fun. And I think that's how the devil works a lot of times in our own life. We start drifting along one compromise here, one compromise there. And so what we do is in stages we get deeper and deeper into sin and temptation when before it was just, you know, listening to secular music. Then listening to secular music now turns into you using the profanity that you're hearing. Then using the profanity that you're hearing makes you more disrespectful to authority. Then you don't care about authority. To you. Then you start getting involved with maybe... Um, crime related things because you've lost your respect for all authority and for all other people and so little by little it's like this pull I was not unfortunately I was not able to resist that pull because I didn't discern what was happening to me I remember getting involved when I was young with the wrong crowds I remember getting involved when I got into my high school age um, shoplifting was a big thing for me. I remember uh, trying to get away with little things, you know. First it started off with stealing soda from the Costco fountains. You know, you're supposed to pay for the drink. We just walk up with our own cup and like just fill up our thing and see if we can walk off and nobody say anything to us. It starts off little by little. Next thing you know, we're hitting stores like Ross and TJ Maxx and we're trying to walk in with sandals and walk out with shoes on. You know, hopefully they don't see us. And so you become more bold in the crimes that you allow yourself to get involved in. And unfortunately, that happened in my experience. And not only that, um, getting involved more with friends who were either on drugs or doing drugs and as I got older and of age getting involved with going to clubs getting involved with dancing getting involved with one thing that I was always drawn to was cars and so we used to go to what in Florida they would call La Fiebre the Spanish were saying the fever you know it was it was where the cars would meet up 
This was before the days of Fast and Furious. Then it became so popular that they decided to make a movie about it. But those were in the days that we were diving into racing cars, you know. And this car racing was illegal. Uh, a lot of times we would endanger ourselves and other people. We'd get out there on the highways. And I remember, you know, with my friends, we'd say, okay, we're going to go from this exit to such and such exit down the road. Whoever gets there first, by whatever means, that's what you do. And here we are driving at a fast pace. You see, the more older I got, I'm not under the direct supervision of my parents. I get my own license, I get my own car, and I have too many negative friends. And these are the things that young people are exposed to today, probably in a greater degree than I was years ago because the world's only getting worse in, yeah. in evil and morality. And so I found myself being pulled in this direction. And I, I'm still thankful to God, though, because I, I, I remember all the temptations of being involved with alcohol, with drugs. And there was something about those early seats from mom and dad. Something about those early devotions and those the investment that they gave us, the spiritual investment that they placed in, there was a deep-seated conviction that even though, it's kind of mysterious, <laughs> even though I was involved in such all negative things, there was something about substance abuse that frightened me dearly, and I never got involved with it. I can't commend my life in any way. I was still involved with other foolish things. I just... Confess to everybody here that I had shoplifting, etc. Yeah. But there was something about substance abuse. No drugs, no alcohol. That was not a part of my actual participation. I had friends that were. Since I liked the car, we'd go to the clubs. Jose was always the designated driver because I wasn't the drinker. <laughs> but at the same time, I'm, I do look back. And for that one little tidbit, I am grateful for the Lord's mercy. There was an extra strong... Conviction. I can't, I can't participate in that. And yeah. so I, I didn't get involved heavily in drug usage or alcoholism, even though with my friends and with my environment, it was surrounding me. And now some of those things that you were getting involved with, uh, did you feel, I'm sure, I mean, it's kind of natural to maybe feel it, uh, but did you feel like guilty doing it? You know, did your... Uh, some of those seeds that you know our parents instilled in you did they come back to you come back to your minds did you have like second thoughts or it was just to a point where you had maybe drifted uh, too far in the sense that you know you were still kind of like comfortable doing it you didn't have no guilt about it yeah um, you know the first initial times when you're with your friends, there's this spirit of thrill and, you know, adrenaline and getting away with little things. Like I said, it, it's not a little thing. Let me, let me make that clear. It's wrong. It's a crime. It's stealing. It's breaking God's commandments. But somebody might say, well, it's just a fountain drink. You're stealing a fountain drink from a restaurant. You know? yeah. But it starts off little, but then it gets more deeper and deeper and deeper. And so the more that you participate in it, Initially, those first thoughts was, oh, no, I can't do this. No, whatever, you know. But when you get away with it, all of a sudden, you know, the devil adds to your temptations. Now he's adding pride. Like, oh, I'm good at this. Yeah. And so you tend to, to practice it more frequently. But, you know, from time to time, when you're by yourself and when you're not surrounded by the influence of your friends, when you're by yourself and you're... you're thinking oftentimes I would say to myself what am I doing you know I had those moments frequently what am I doing I didn't stop what I was doing but I do remember from time to time everybody has periods whether you're in the shower by yourself or you're just walking by the way or you're driving to work or whatever you're doing it's usually when you're by yourself sometimes you have thoughts of self-reflection and you say what am I doing yeah um, so, uh, during like high school and stuff, uh, was there, uh, ever like 
I guess, moments that you can appreciate that God was trying to reach you, uh, though you may not have seen it or you may not have even wanted it. You know, what were some of those times where God tried to reach you even in those moments? (laughs) And you just kind of like denied it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You are bringing sweet memories to me. I'll never forget, my friend. I'm just gonna say his. Uh, I'm just gonna say his first name, Jay. Man, praise God for Jay. Jay came to the school where we were at, and Jay had come fully from the world, but when he came to the school. He came on fire for God because he didn't come from an Adventist upbringing. He came from the world. And when he came in, he was so on fire for God that he thought that at the school where all these other people were who were Christians, that he was going to meet on fire people. So he came and I remember him coming up to me and he was like, hey, Jose, man, why don't you come out door knocking with us? We're passing. I said, what are you you doing? What do you mean door knocking? Door knocking for what? And Jay, he would say, man, he was like, this is the word of God, brother. And he would like point, you know, and in my mind, I'm into hip hop. I'm into sports. I'm into. And I just looked at this guy like, wow. Like those were what the elders of my church were doing. But (laughs) there was nobody (laughs) my age group doing that. But man, when Jay would come up to us, I just saw. And then, you know. His, his example was, an, was a testimony to my life. He never really preached at us or told us anything bad. It was just the invitation. And I felt convicted that one time or two he invited me to join what they were doing and I denied it, you know. But after I denied it, man, it was just echoing in my head like I felt the strong impression I should be accepting his invitation. Jay, by the way, went on to be a preacher he still works for the Lord today. He has a beautiful family. And uh, I praise God for Jay. I look back. There was another guy in my life. Two guys specifically. Another guy named Jared. And another brother named Kellen. And I don't know if they're listening, but if they hear, um, God bless you guys, man. You guys mean more to me than you know if I haven't expressed it enough. These guys, along with Jay... Something about these two guys that they had a good upbringing. I could tell that they had good family, even though I, I wasn't so acquainted with all of their family. I knew Jared's parents, but I, I never met Kellen's parents. But anyways, there was something about these guys that they, they exhibited a Christian influence. And I think they look up to me because I was more of the, again, I was more social. You know, I was not afraid to be loud and and be a comedian kind of a character and talk to the guys and make everybody laugh. And I had a good social dynamic that kind of gave me an upper edge as far as, you know, being able to have a lot of friends versus people who are quieter and didn't have as many friends or whatnot. I was more in a limelight type of atmosphere just because the way I carried myself. But... As much as they looked up to me in many respects, without knowing it or without me ever expressing it, I looked up to them because I saw that they had principle. While I was struggling in various regions, especially my health, which we'll probably talk about here in a minute, but they were, they I could tell that they had good solid principles and it reminded me of what my parents had taught me. And so God put people in my life here and there and influences here and there that I can look back and I can thank God that while I chose to have negative experiences by the people that I hung around time and time again days or week after week or month after month God would always bring some kind of conviction this is the better way of life this is the principle that you need to have and so it's an inward struggle in the mind yeah. But I was confronted a lot with those convictions. Yeah. So uh, I guess we can start maybe transitioning to, uh, I guess I would say maybe it's one of your biggest struggles that you had. And uh, you mentioned a little bit about it of health. 
so I guess uh, go into that a little bit and maybe I guess start transitioning into this is maybe when the Lord is uh, steadily reaching your heart and yeah. coming to Christ moments. Okay, so I'll try to summarize the best that I can. I could share so much because yeah. God has done a lot, but I'll try to summarize the best that I can. When I was very young, we mentioned about video games and our parents leaving us at home for several hours. When you're idle, I don't know about you guys, but me, I'm bored, I've been playing video games, I'm done watching TV, I walk back and forth to the refrigerator, check it, open it up. I already looked at what's in there, but you're like looking for something to munch on, to snack on. And so with me, I used to indulge. My, my father, he kind of had a sweet tooth, you know? And he would always have these little, these little um, snacks in the house. I kind of joke around and call her my uh, my ex-girlfriend. <laughs> I always called her Little Debbie. <laughs> she was so sweet. <laughs> anyway, that's my little joke about it. But yeah, I always like those Little Debbie snacks. Nutter butter, zebra cake, star crunch, oatmeal cream pies. My, my, uh, my dad made sure that those things were in the house. And so unfortunately, staying home and being idle, I would always be snacking on these things. And from probably sixth grade up until eighth grade, I was growing and growing, and I was overweight young man, young boy. When I was freshman year in high school, I weighed 205 pounds. I don't even weigh that today. Wow. But my freshman year in high school, 14 years old, I weighed more then than I do right now. And so by the time I had graduated high school, I was probably 290, 295 pounds. Just a short time thereafter, I had reached over 300 pounds. I had gotten involved in a relationship at an early uh, age after I graduated that I should not have been involved in. Um, I was more or less living with a, a woman at the time. And... Uh, I was stressed out because she had children and she had gone through a divorce and there was a kind of like a custody thing going on. So being at a young age, 19 years old, 20 years old, I kind of went into immediate fatherhood, not exactly, but kind of with dating this woman who had children and I was not prepared for that. I shouldn't have been in that relationship and it kind of escalated the stress in my life and I would remember waking up with panicking you know palpitations in my heart and and I think where it finally like reached a climax I was so stressed out by the relationship we were having problems I, I had a lot of stress because I'm trying to help her with these young boys and I think I just was wrestling against the convictions of my heart, knowing that I shouldn't be in this relationship. My health is not doing well. Why is my life this way? It was just stress. It was the most stress that I ever remember having in my life. And shortly after high school, I'm going to say 21 years old or so, maybe 20, 20 years old, I was working at a dealership when I graduated, uh, I ended up getting into automotive work. And I was working at a Ford dealership. And I remember taking the tire off of a truck one day, I was a mechanic. And I just remember feeling a strong pounding and pain right here in my heart. I dropped down to one knee because it was so severe that I was trying to catch my breath. I was kind of short of breath, kind of a piercing pain that went through my chest and out my back kind of I could barely breathe and ended up going to the hospital the doctor when they examined me they did EKG and stuff the doctor basically said I, I believe Jose you've had a small minor heart attack just 20 years old well come to find out that it wasn't exactly a heart attack I did have a heart palpitation issue I remember them sending me with a heart monitor. I'd have to wear these patches. And anytime I felt anxiety or my heart palp palpitating, I'd have to hit the button and they would record it. They would call me and say, Jose, do we need to dispatch an ambulance, etc." 
But in their search to find out what was going on, what ended up happening is it was actually stomach related. It wasn't heart related. I'm grateful for that. But the stomach related issue was I was so stressed out that I had developed a stomach ulcer. And so it was the piercing pain and stuff. It's kind of embarrassing, but it was gas related. <laughs> So it was painful, you know, it was going through my chest and it was just making me uncomfortable. But the reason why is because since I thought that I had heart problems because my heart was beating all the time fast because of the stress and anxieties that I had, I saw on the commercial it was Bayer Aspirin, the heart medicine. And I was popping those things like it was M&M's. So all the stress plus taking too much aspirin, it caused me to develop a minor ulcer in my digestive system and this was causing a lot of acid reflux I couldn't lay down flat on my back like most people do in a bed I had to sleep up in a lazy boy chair I ended up breaking off with my girlfriend and I was just feeling that my life was just a mess cuz I'm like I'm young I'm over here struggling I got digestive issues, I got heart issues, I got all kind of health things going on. I knew that I needed a change. So Edgar, he's one of my good friends too. He had just recently joined the gym and he called me up and he's always been a good friend to me. I praise God for Edgar. Edgar said, hey, Jose, why don't you come to the gym, you know, blow some steam off kind of free your mind a little bit and just come work out. I've already lost a few pounds. He was kind of a bigger guy like me at the time. So I said, yeah, why not? I joined the gym. And I believe that's where my, kind of my journey started. Yeah. I, um, I joined the gym, started working out. And um, it probably didn't last too long before I kind of ran out of steam, so to speak. But one day... If I could just kind of bring this to a short close here, uh, this least this little segment. I know you have more questions for me. But one day, I had a second job, not just working at the dealership, but in the evenings I would work at the local hospital, kind of pushing around wheelchairs for, you know, they call it an orderly or a patient transporter. I was pushing wheelchairs and I saw a little flyer and it said that there was a doctor who was going to be giving a seminar down in the basement. And then it said on the flyer something along the degree of, are you stressed in your life? <laughs> Is your health suffering? Come learn about God's Bible teachings on health or what have you. I forgot the exact, this was... <laughs> This was uh, almost 20 years ago, so you'll forgive me. I went down to that, the, pres the presenter. This is what he said. He started preaching on Daniel. Now, I had grew up in the church, but the only thing that I knew about Daniel, <laughs> that's the guy in the lion's den. Yeah. I didn't realize it was like a whole entire prophetic, profound book of the Bible, and perhaps one of the most important for this time in which we're living in. Take a note on that. <laughs> Anyhow, um, he started to talk about Daniel chapter 1. And he talked about the Daniel challenge. And basically in Daniel chapter 1, they asked the king of Babylon if they could maintain a plant-based diet. And then after a time of evaluation, they would compare to the other persons and to see if they would be healthy and fit to continue to be trained and work for the king. When the king finally examined them, they were found 10 times better than the other individuals. And I said, wow. So anyhow, I wanted to do this Daniel 10 day challenge. And so I needed to eat healthy for 10 days. Well, I didn't know what to eat. <laughs> Mama was still working a lot. Everybody was scattered. We all kind of had, by this time, and we're coming to our adult lives. 
I had left off my girlfriend. I went back home to live back home. But I had to fend for myself when it came to eat unless mom made a big plate for the beginning for the whole week type of thing. So since I didn't really know how to cook that well and I wasn't sure what all plant-based people eat, all I ate was salad for 10 days. I lost weight, but I was starving. <laughs> I said, this is not going to work. This is not going to work. Anyhow, I continued going to that downstairs basement service apparently I learned that they were holding it every week and while I was going down there I tend to like to sing I decided that I needed to be more consistent in my church going life and so I started going down there and during the song service I would sing out loud you know and because I like to sing some of the song leaders picked up that I had the ability to carry a note and they invited me to join the song service, the praise team, they called it. The elder who invited me says that we practice on Friday nights. He says, come at such and such a time. When I would show up at such and such a time, 8 o'clock I believe it was, there was like another group coming out while we, the practice group, was coming in. And out of curiosity, I asked them, I said, hey, how come this, you know, just out of curiosity, every time we show up, there's some other people who are leaving. And he goes, oh, I was hoping you would ask. I wanted to invite you to that. That's our Bible study group. So we have music practice after our Bible study. And he says, you should come, Jose. And I said, eh. <laughs> I wasn't so interested because I still had a worldly pool, you know, even though I was kind of getting involved with the church. But he didn't push it on me, but he kind of brought it up every time, you know. It wasn't, he did it in a loving way, but he would say, you sure you don't want to come? And I was like, no, nah, I'm okay. Then he said it again. Hey, you should come. Eventually, he convinced me to go, and they were studying a little book. I decided to go, and when I saw the little book that they were studying, it said, Steps to Christ. I said, wow. I think I went home and ate up that book, In the next two, three days, I was done with that book. I just ate it. It's a small book, but I recommend it to everybody. Yeah. And um, I picked up that book. And after I was done reading it, I was so intrigued that I wanted to meet this lady. I read the name. Her name was Ellen White. I thought she was probably some old lady in California. <laughs> I had heard the name before. I, I wasn't ignorant that that name existed, but I was ignorant enough that I didn't know that she had already passed away and she lived <laughs> long before I ever did. So I came home and asked my father about it, and I said, Hey, Dad, so you ever heard of this lady, Ellen White? Doesn't she live somewhere in California? And he says, What? He's like, Man, that lady is gone. And then I was like, Well, I just read this book. He's like, Well, there's more books she wrote. And I was like, Really? Show me them. My father took me into the garage. There was a bookcase that he had in that garage. He blew off all the dust of that bookcase. And he says, you want to learn about her? Here she is. So at the time, I was struggling with my health. The Daniel diet thing, challenge. It was a conviction, but I didn't follow through with it because all I was eating was salad. And I said, that's not working for me. You know, that was good for Daniel, but I can't, I can't handle salad. <laughs> well, it's because I didn't know better then. And so I was kind of looking through the bookcase and one book that jumped out to me, The Ministry of Healing. And when I grabbed that book, The Ministry of Healing, and I started reading it, that's when the strongest convictions that I ever knew in my life. You know why? The Steps of Christ was a good book, but it kind of just planted the seed. I didn't feel like it broke me, so to speak. Because while I related to it, I was still kind of learning the themes. But I felt that the moment where the Lord brought me to true repentance and broke me was when I learned that there was a strong relation between our spiritual life and the physical life. And the biggest struggle that I was going through, to kind of wrap up this little segment, is that I was struggling with my health. And as I read that book and saw that there was a correlation between our salvation with God 
and our response to that salvation in how we live out our life. I realized that I was not living my life in harmony with the salvation that I professed as a Christian. And man, it broke me. I remember many nights of tears asking the Lord to change my heart. And that was the beginning sprinklings of reading principles of heaven that began transforming my soul. That was the very beginning of it. Amen. Uh, maybe you can uh, share just because uh, I know you've been in uh, ministry for a while now, but I guess maybe s some early moments of, you know, the, the upward path now, you know, now that you have uh, kind of fully accepted Christ, Christ was like reaching your heart to the fullest, so maybe some of those early moments, because um, I mean, you probably have a, a lot to share with uh, just being involved with ministry a lot, but it's always in, uh, encouraging to have those early moments, your excitement of the truth that uh, you now receive that you want to share with others. Uh, maybe tell some stories or some instances uh, in those beginning moments. Okay, yeah, yeah. So when I read that book, wow, I was convicted, let me tell you. At that time in my life, I was borrowing my, I call her my tia, but uh, that's for Spanish, that's my aunt. Some Americans say aunt. <laughs> Anyhow, she uh, was letting me borrow her car. Uh, one day she called me up and she demanded that I bring the car back. <laughs> I thought it was funny because I didn't know why she didn't tell me. Later I found out, you know those red light cameras? <laughs> I think I read the red light camera. I, I ran the red light camera by accident. And she got a ticket in the mail and that was the end of me borrowing her car. <laughs> So, but that was a good thing because what it forced, it forced uh, a circumstance in my life where I needed to get to work, but now she took the car that I was using and I didn't have no car. So I had to bike it to work. I was seven miles from my job to the dealership, the Ford dealership, and I had to wake up early. And so I started riding my bike early and I was forced into exercise because <laughs> I didn't want to lose my job. So here I am riding my bike just really early in the morning. And man, it took me forever to get to work, I felt like. But after several months, I was losing weight, I was burning calories, I was cycling, and I had a new path of diet, and the, the conviction and motivation was from God because I was learning better health principles from that book, Ministry of Healing. I learned about the blessing of going back to, and then here's God, you know, in His providence, I realized, oh, this is what the doctor was talking about with the Daniel diet and learning to be plant-based. It's almost as if we had a path back to Eden because that was the original plan of God for mankind. Mm -hmm. And so when I was learning these things, here's something powerful, right? In my early, early days, there's something called your first love. And boy, I was on fire for God. I would, I would ride my bike, I'd be reading. I was so convicted by what I was reading that I was getting the exercise, I was changing my diet, I was losing the weight, and I had went from, a, from over 300 pounds down to 150 pounds. I had lost half the weight. You know, people say, oh, you're half the man you used to be. <laughs> In that sense, it's a positive thing. Yeah. Anyways, I didn't want to spend the money because we had uniforms at the job. I didn't want to spend the money, so I remember taking my belt loops of my pants and tying zip ties around them in order to squeeze my waist enough to keep these big baggy pants. And I was performing better at my job, so much so that I was gaining bonuses and extra work. I was running everywhere. And everyone in my job noticed how much weight I had lost. And I was reading and reading and reading and I finally came across Daniel once again and I decided, you know what, I want to read all about Daniel. And I started studying Bible prophecy through Daniel and Revelation. I was so convicted that somehow within me, the Lord gave me the encouragement that I needed to begin sharing what I was learning. And so I, with a trembling, you know, attempt, I typed out, a little invitation and I posted it in the lunch break room of the dealership that I worked at. 
And for some reason, they probably changed the operation, but at this particular dealership, the entire dealership closed down for lunch. It was advantageous for what I was trying to do because everybody was available at the same time. From 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock, the whole entire dealership. Sales, service, administration, everybody goes to lunch at 1. The whole dealership shut down. Uh, better business practices, they stagger it now <laughs> so the dealership can keep flowing. But back in those days, for whatever reason, everyone closed down. I'm only emphasizing that because that made all the people in the dealership available. If they wanted to attend my study, they could. And when I posted that study in the break room, would you believe that several people showed up? I don't remember the exact number, but of somewhere between six to nine people the first time I decided to give a Bible study at the dealership in the lunch break room. See, so here, here I am in my dirty mechanic clothes with my little Bible and just sharing what I had been learning in the book of Daniel. Let me tell you this. A few months go by. I'm going to say three months. Would you know that I counted one time the most people I ever had in one Bible study? 30 people. People from the sales department. People from the uh, service department. People who were handling the paperwork. They had heard about it. God was giving me influence in that dealership. I remember we were in the break room. And we decided we were outgrowing that break room. We had it to use. There were some tables in the showroom floor of the sales department. So we had all these employees out over there, and I'm giving them a Bible study. And the owner of the dealership, you know the guy that has his name on top of the building? He showed up that day. And he said, hey, what's going on here? I didn't call for a meeting. What's everybody, you know, why are you guys here gathered together? And someone yells out, ask him. And they all pointed to me. So I said, we're having a Bible study. And he says, a Bible study? <laughs> He said, this is a dealership. This is not a Bible study. And he says, go use the conference room. Well, I was a dirty mechanic. We worked out in the warehouse. I didn't know there was a conference room. So they pointed me up there. The sales guys knew all about it. And I went upstairs. Wow, this very elegant, you know, long tables, comfortable chairs, a marker board to write on. It was perfect. This happened for several few more other months. And this was back in 2008. For those of you who remember the economy at that time, there was kind of like a real estate crash that happened around that time. The economy was not doing too good, and a lot of businesses were making cutbacks. And so there was a, my immediate supervisor one day during that time frame, he called me into his office, and you gotta see this guy, he was huge. He had to be about 6'5", I wouldn't doubt that he could bench press 400 pounds. I mean, this guy had muscles. He had his, a big, long mustache, kind of looked like a Harley motorcycle guy. And he was a huge, strong, deep voice, intimidating guy. This guy called me into his office. He was my supervisor, or my, my boss, actually. And I saw him starting to tear up, trying to attempt to tell me something. And I didn't know what exactly he was trying to tell me. And I'm like, what's going on? You know, <laughs> see this big old guy, muscle guy, he's almost in tears. And he says, Jose, I'm, I'm sorry to report this to you, but it's not coming from me, man. You're one of my best workers. I see you running all over this dealership. Because God had convicted me as I'm giving my life little by little to him. He had convicted me, do your best in everything that you put your hands to do. And I tried to be the best mechanic that I could be. I tried to, 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 to push out as many cars as possible. And it was showing, it was reflecting, God was giving me influence in this dealership. And he said, if it was my, if it was my choice, you're one of my best workers, I wouldn't let you go. He said, but it's coming above me, man. There's nothing I can do. And he felt so bad he had to let me go. And this is what he said. He said, Jose... The big boss, the guy whose name is on the dealership, he says, you don't want to be a mechanic. You want to be a preacher. He says, so go preach, but I have to let you go. And I was just like, did I just get fired? <laughs> they were making cutbacks. It wasn't due to my performance, but I was one of the newest guys hired. The cutbacks of the 2008 economy 
since I was the last guy hired, so to speak, I'm the first guy fired. And plus, you know, there may have been complaints here and there that I won't touch on from individuals. This is a great controversy that we're in who didn't like that I was preaching to everybody. But when I drove home that day, I left after lunch. I didn't have a full day because he let me go halfway through the day. I'm driving home and it was bitter. It was kind of bittersweet. I, I just lost my job, you know, so that was bitter. But it was sweet because the echo in my head, go preach. Go preach. I left that dealership and I knew I had to make some changes. I said, Lord, I want to give my all to you. I got involved with call portering. I signed up, went to the local uh, conference office and asked them I wanted to join evangelism. One guy suggested call portering. I said, let's do it. So I took a few training classes and I went out knocking door to door selling books. Well, I didn't realize it at the time. But when I read a book called Call Porter Ministry, since I was involved in that, I started reading and it says, this is one of the best training grounds for the ministry. So here I am, just lost my job at the dealership, but immediately I'm transitioning to working full time with the Lord. Started Amen. knocking on doors, started going out, started gravitating towards the ministry. What a blessing. Amen. So I guess uh, uh, you could start maybe uh, transitioning because I know it's a, a lot of interim uh, between that, but I guess start transitioning of what you're kind of involved with today. You know, do you have your own ministry and maybe talk about uh, that. And, you know, if you want to know about some of the other details that he's been doing i'm sure you can contact him or maybe we just have him on another time um but um maybe start talking about the transition of getting your own ministry and kind of what you are involved in today yeah eventually god convicted me that i needed to enter into a path that he would have me go i left florida with my brother in order to try to find that path we went state to state trying our hands at different things, trying to help one church, trying to help this family. But just to summarize, by and by, we came to Oklahoma. And I found a place where we could do ministry there. And they invited me to be the preacher slash Bible worker of this church. While I was at that church, there was a camp meeting that was going to happen later that year. And when I went to the camp meeting, I'll give all the details maybe at another time, but that's where the Lord uh, had me to meet my wife. Amen. <laughs> by and by, she and I got together. Our relationship, our relationship grew by doing Bible studies. And I just praise God for Him selecting a companion for me. We got married, and uh, arrangements happened where... Um, I found myself being called and asked to lead out in different churches. And so the Lord impressed upon me many years ago this Bible verse in Revelation 14, 12. We are known for the three angels' messages in Adventism. And verse number 12, Revelation 14, verse 12 says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And so an extraction from that text, patience of the saints and faith of Jesus, of course, commandment keeping in the middle. The Lord gave me the name of ministry called Patient Faith Ministry. And so through the years, I've tried to kind of develop this Ministry. Uh, I've had to learn as I go, as I read, through the experiences and through the convictions. And for the last several years, I've been involved full-time in helping churches, doing evangelism, doing door knocking, doing booths at fairs. And currently, God's providence has brought us to the Pacific Northwest. We live in Portland, Oregon. And... Uh, we have our church group. It's called Three Angels Remnant Church. And probably our biggest ministry goal with our church and with Patient Faith Ministry working together 
we want to cultivate something called an outpost center. And more or less, it's basically a place on the outskirts of the city, a country property, where we can have a training center, we can train missionary, medical missionaries, we can train Bible workers, we can learn agriculture, and we can have a place by which we can spread the Three Angels message in this region in which we live. And that's what my wife and I, along with our church group, is currently engaged in right now. And are you guys able to receive uh, donations uh, for these kind of uh, work that you're involved with, uh, seeking to um, establish this outpost center? Yes, uh, by God's grace, if you feel so impressed to help our ministry, we would greatly appreciate that. Um, you can donate to uh, Three Angels Remnant Church. You can go to a website that we have. We're still kind of developing the website. Be patient with us. We're not electronic people, so we're trying to do our best. But there is a website, 3arc.org. 3arc.org. And you can find PayPal there. Another way you can indirectly, um, you can actually look up Patient Faith. It's a little easier to find. And you can just delegate it to where you would like it to go. And we can add it to our Outpost Center fund that we're reaching. But we have both YouTube and Facebook. Just look up Patient Faith. You'll see a little logo that has several colors. It looks like a shield. Patient Faith Ministry Evangelist Jose Rivera. Yeah, and I, and I can also put all of that in the description so that you guys can have uh, easy access, uh, at least for this video. And uh, I guess uh, lastly would be, um, you know, what are some final thoughts of uh, encouragement to those that are listening in that may have gone through some of the things that you went through? Um, yeah, just final uh, encouragement for the people. Yeah, you know, my particular story, I was born into the church, and one of the hardest temptations and sins that I struggle with in my life, as I shared here, is our health. And so I want to appeal to those of you, of course all of you, but especially those of you who are struggling with your health. I know the struggle of overeating. I know the struggle of food temptations and addictions. I know the struggles of those things. Appetite is one of the strongest temptations to the human race so strong that that's how sin came into humanity was through Eve and Adam when they took hold of the fruit the forbidden fruit the devil used appetite when he came to try to get Adam and Eve to fall and he succeeded and then in his attempt to Christ the very first temptation recorded of Christ in the Bible is when Christ was, after his baptism, went into the wilderness. And what did the devil tempt him? He says, turn these stones into bread. So notice, where mankind dropped the ball, appetite, Christ in his redemption for us, he picked up the ball, so to speak. And he overcame on the point of appetite. And if Christ overcame on appetite, that means he will give power to you. He has helped me tremendously a great deal in my life in that area. And so I know that He can encourage you. If you're struggling with anything dealing with health, God can give you overcoming power. I know that He can. He can help you in any area. But my special appeal, since that's kind of where my uh, testimony is, my special appeal is God can give you health if you only trust Him. Amen. So I hope that you guys were blessed uh, by my brother's testimony here. Um, if you were, again, I'd like to solicit that you uh, like the video. Uh, comment below also, like if you like this new type of format, keep it in prayer because, you know, that's, uh, this helps me in my communication. So we're, we're all growing. And if you are truly blessed by it as well, please out of all of the ones, out of all of the admonitions of liking and subscribing, share the video if you were truly blessed, because if you were truly blessed, then others will be truly blessed as well. Again, my name is Shelton with Brotherly Love Ministry. And my name is Jose, and this is what the Lord has done for me.